It does come with a few, um, I would say, advantages that you won't find in a traditional mutual funds or unit trust because of its tradability. At least when the market tanks, all hope is not lost eventually. <laughs> but having said that, of course, this shouldn't serve as like a convenient excuse. La. Because the sector grew by 40% last year doesn't mean that it will grow on 40% year on year. Very similar to taking a gamble, taking a bet on that sector will do well, that sector will do well. ETFs are risk-free and foolproof. Is this statement true or false? Struggling to keep up? Welcome to the FOMO Fix. Tired of missing out on investment opportunities? You have come to the right place. We will help you get financially healthy without the fear of missing out. On the FOMO Fix, we are all about building real wealth at your own pace. I'm Hazel from The Joyful Investors, your navigator on this journey towards financial empowerment. Today, we have Wei Chin from SGX who will share his insights on investing and Jeremy who is getting started on his investment journey. So myself is Wei Chin. I'm the ETF product manager at SGX. So I work with um, issuers on their listings of ETF on the exchange. I also work with the uh, securities brokers, the distributors to engage investors on how they could use ETF to as part of their financial journey. So my name is Jeremy. So I, a little bit about me is that I come from the built environment dealing with the construction sector. So investing perhaps is more of like trying to make my money work a little bit more for me. So that's where I move into it and to find out more about it. Okay, so today we're going to talk about a topic that many retail investors would be keen to learn more about and that is exchange traded funds or in short EDS. Okay, so to kick things off, perhaps Wei Chin, you can share with us a little bit more on what are EDS exactly and how do they work? So ETF as the name uh, spells for itself uh, exchange traded funds so it's exchange traded it's listed on the exchange but it do have the characteristics of a fund itself in terms of its diversification and the ease of owning a basket of companies through a single uh, instrument and it does come to a few um, I would say advantages that you won't find in a traditional mutual funds or unit trust because of its tradability so for example it's extremely transparent in terms of the underlying assets that you're holding for instance, in STI ETFs, you will know which are the 30 stocks that you are holding in your portfolio. And if you are looking at price transparency, the in instance where you have purchased your ETFs, you know the price you are paying, right? But then for traditional funds, uh, probably we need to wait for one or two days before you know what's the asset value that you're getting. So that's the fundamental differences. And I think that's also a very key reasons why we are seeing a growth in adoption for ETFs. Mm, okay, so Jeremy, as a fellow retail investor yourself, do you find ETFs useful for you in this journey? I feel that ETF actually forms a very stable base for any investors um, because like that like which has mentioned, you know, it basically captures a whole list of company into a, a, into a basket of stocks. So if you look at the S&P 500, it kind of holds on the largest 500 companies in, in, in the US. And I feel that ETF forms a very good base for them to start at least when the market tanks, they know that um, all hope is not lost eventually <laughs> over time. But because if you invest in individual companies per se, mm. um, they can go burst. And that's, yes, that's, yeah, right. that's, that's quite detrimental to any portfolio. Mm. Yeah, so that's just my general view on ETFs. Then Wei Xin, how do you think you know, ETFs can be beneficial for investors? Like what kind of role can it play for investors? So for investors who are really first, first time getting into investments, they're still trying to figure out what kind of investments suits them the most. Yes. It could be difficult as a start right, mm. without a, a proper handholding. So ETF could be a good starting point. It's a very easy way to enter into the market. And the transparency helps you because you know what you're getting, right? In a way, you know that the company is there in the basket. It's very flexible as well because for individual investors, you may want to use ETF to just build a core allocation. Right. And it's flexible because today ETF is no longer a stocks, only ETFs. You do have fixed income, bonds. Yes. You do have money market ETFs. You do have REITs ETFs. Mm -hmm. You do have even like uh, gold or precious metal yes. ETFs. And that allows investors to simply using ETF as a very basic building blocks. Mm. And last but not least, also efficiency. Mm. It's very efficient, partly because of the low cost nature. If you compare the ETS to most of the unit trust in the market, the cost is simply a fraction of it. And for simple reasons, because it, it, it forgo the distribution cost, ETF can be a DIY, DIY investing. You can buy it from the exchange. You don't have to pay through a middleman. Probably incur some commissions on brokerage charges. 
Um, but that's just a fraction of uh, the total cost of investing. Um, so I think these three are the key reasons why we think that ETF could be a good start for uh, mm. be beginner investors. Right, right. Uh, and I believe that ETFs, yes, definitely they can be very beneficial, especially for certain groups of investors. Let's say, uh, you know, they don't have the knowledge, like what you have mentioned. So they don't have the knowledge to do individual analysis of the individual companies to do stock selection. Or for a certain group of people, let's say they really somehow can't find time to do the stock picking themselves, then ETFs would be a very useful tool to let them dig their toes into the financial markets. There's this analogy that I often use to share with my students to illustrate the point on ETFs. And uh, that is like traveling. Because you see, in traveling, right, we have two main categories of travelers, right? One category, they want to do free and easy. So they will plan their own itinerary. On the other hand, the other category, uh, they will opt for convenience. So therefore, they will go to tour agencies, they will sign up for package tour groups. But no, there's nothing wrong with signing up for package tour groups, right? Uh, it's just that when you do that, you need to be able to understand uh, and accept the fact that sometimes maybe they might bring you to certain places that is not as photo-worthy. Or maybe, you know, uh, I'm not really that keen in that place. But I can't tell the tour guide, please take out that place from the itinerary because the whole tour group is not catered just for me but for all the masses. So similarly in the same vein for ETFs, perhaps certain ETFs, maybe they have certain uh, part of their funds, maybe they could have put into certain companies that are not as fundamentally sound but nonetheless, uh, we don't have a say, right? Um, the ETF managers would do their job. But overall, it is still a very, very beneficial tool for retail investors to dip their toes into the investing market. Yeah. But having said that, of course, this shouldn't serve as like a convenient excuse la, for us to get lazy or not to upskill ourselves further, right? To learn more about how to analyze the individual companies. Right. So uh, as with any investments, it is really important that we have a good understanding of how it works, right? what it entails when we get invested in it. So uh, here I've compiled a list of common myths surrounding ETFs and let's see if they are really true or if we can debunk them. So the first myth is ETFs are risk-free and foolproof. Is this statement true or false? False. False. Um, for Jeremy also? Nah, I don't think it's, I don't oh. think it's right okay. as well. Okay, let's start from hearing from which inverse. So ETF itself is you would call it a vehicle, mm. uh, whether it's a high risk, moderate risk or low risk or risk-free mm. investments, it really depending on the underlying asset. Yes. So if you do invest into a, let's say, very narrowly focused uh, technology sector ETFs, uh, certainly mm. the stake is higher in terms of risk Yes. Uh, because the whole sector could be more volatile. We have seen what has happened in recent years on China tech sector. Certainly had a good run in the early 2020s, but uh, recent years we do see that it's exhibit a very high volatility nature. Right. And certainly there has been some drawdown in the recent years. But if you're looking at, say, an investment grade bond ETFs or even a money market investment grade uh, uh, instrument ETFs, you could see a much lower volatility. Mm -hmm. That being said, it can never be risk-free. Mm -hmm. uh, even a sovereign wealth uh, or rather a sovereign bond itself, there could mm -hmm. be some risk if the if the country do go down. Yes. Of course, then you got to look at the com uh, country rating. A triple A certainly is, is much lower risk than say a, a, a high yield or rather a non-investment grade mm -hmm. sovereign uh, bonds. So uh, bottom line is ETF is a vehicle. The level of risk you are taking on depends on the underlying investments and that varies between equities, bonds, REITs and gold. Mm, great. Very good. I mean, to jump on, I guess, um, like the saying goes, like, the greater the returns, the more volatility and the more risk that any investor is taking on. I just got an example. If you look at ARK ETFs, um, it went up super well, yes. but it also crashes um, <laughs> really well as well. Um, but I'm not, I'm not saying that the Underlining holdings are not good per se, but I'm just talking purely based on the performance, price, the, the performance of mm. the stock, the, the ETF prices. Mm -hmm. So they are bound to have risk um, in any investment assets. Um, Definitely. Even even if you talk about you know unit trust, etc., there's always certain forms of risk, and I guess that's this comes with the underlining returns that that each ETF or or, or uh, um, promises for the for the investor. So the truth is that there's definitely risk for ETS investing. Mm, I think uh, both of you have pointed out a really good point, which is to look at the underlying, right? So for example, if you're talking about equity ETFs, then the underlying is made out of a basket of stocks. So the next question to ask ourselves is, are individual stocks risk-free? 
I'm pretty sure the answer is a clear no. Mm. Therefore, how can ETFs be risk-free if they're made of something that's not completely risk-free or foolproof? Right. So a very good example is to just take a look at, say, you know, the market index ETF. Look at their stock chart. For example, in the United States, we have the S&P 500 index. So one of the ETF that tracks the S&P 500 index is the SPY ETF. Mm. So if you take a look at the stock chart over the last 10 years, 20 years, you can see that there are retracements, corrections, crashes of various mm. magnitudes. Mm. So therefore, it would not be factually right for us to say that ETFs are completely risk-free or completely foolproof. And I believe that the root of such a misconception, um, it usually lies in that many people do not really understand the concept of diversification. So what a lot of people thought is that, okay, I'm investing in ETFs, so it's very diversified, so it's very safe, right? It's risk-free. But actually, diversification merely reduces the volatilities of our overall investment portfolio, but it may not necessarily increase our returns or take away the risk completely. What can really improve our returns or reduce our risk drastically is the act of investing in high-quality businesses, not just only investing in multiple stocks. That's not enough. The multiple stock must be of a certain high quality. Then yes, it, it wouldn't help. Right? But even then, it can't be completely risk-free for any ETF investments. To add on to the earlier point, I think although ETF is not risk-free, uh, it does help in diversification. So 30 stocks, they move in a different uh, a probably direction most of the time, sometimes. And that will reduce the overall portfolio risk. And in addition to that, today you can build multi-asset portfolio using ETFs. And because different asset classes move at the different probably also market direction at certain market cycle. Uh, that also reduces your overall volatility of your entire investment portfolio. All right, so we managed to debunk the first myth. Okay, so let's move on to the second one. ETFs guarantee high returns. Is this statement true or false? So whether or not there are guaranteed returns, I think, again, it depends on the type of ETF you're buying. Certainly for equities ETF, uh, it's very unlikely because it depends on the share price performance. So yes, there are historical performance. For example, STI could give you a 6 to 7% annualized return over the last 10 years. But the question is, would it guarantee a 6 to 7% next year? May or may, it may or may not be 6%, it may be higher, maybe lower. All the past historical performance that you see from STI, from S uh, S&P 500, these are merely historical performance. For, going forward, it depends on the market performance, depend on the volatility of the market. So, and even for bond ETF, you have some duration risk, you have some interest rate risk that's associated to it, credit rating risk. So there are always risks that may affect the future performance. So I would say if anyone is looking at the historical performance as a guide, it's best used as a guide towards how it has done so far. But you should not assume that in future or in a yearly basis, you should achieve the kind of returns. Mm -hmm. What about Jeremy? Mm, I guess um, there's nothing in guarantee in life. Yes. So regardless whether it's investing or it's any other parts of part and parcel things that matters to us, if you just compare basically STI versus SPY, you know, you, you can look over time, the performance between the two of them also has great differences. And so 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 it's, there's no guarantee that it will always return. And and if you look at the S S&P 500, for the last um, decades, US has always been in a very low interest rate environment. Many tech businesses, which is which are the driving factors for S and P five hundred, are actually enjoying these low interest rates. But as we all know, with the inflation happening the last two years, the infl the interest rate has shot up, and it may or may not go back to where it was previously. And 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 money are no longer coming in cheaply. So, in terms of the growth by all these companies and and the guaranteed returns of ETFs etc., it may not. Um, necessarily be the same as before. So this is how I see it. So to add on to your point regarding you know the how the S&P 500 has a annualized return of about 10% historically, right? So what happens is many investors, they will just take such statistics at face value and they will try to extrapolate it into some kind of guaranteed returns, right? But if we set such kind of expectations, we could be in for disappointment in some years. In fact, previously, I have done some compilation of the data. So I went to look at the performance, yearly performance of S&P 500 from the year 1928 all the way to 2023, which was just last year. So out of 96 years of data, all the results are actually quite shocking. So I found out that there are only 8 years where the S&P 500 really delivered close to that 10%. So of course, I had some leeway, like plus minus 2%. So I went to look at the range between 8 to 12%. There are only 8 years. So 8 out of 96, that is less than 10% probability. So that means to say most of the time, we will be experiencing either a very positive year or a negative year. 
Correct. Right. So therefore, it is very dangerous if we just take all these average numbers and try to extrapolate them into guaranteed return. Because previously, I've also heard from one of my students who shared that last time, what he used to do was he will, uh, instead of putting the money to buy a house and own his residential apartment, what he would do is he would rather put the money into S&P 500 and invest because of the 10%, right? So it seems like a very good way of utilizing your money, right? And then he will rent the house. I mean, renting a house is just an example, right? Other individuals, they could be going through similar situations in terms of their items, big ticket items, expenses planning. Uh, but it can actually be quite volatile because market returns fluctuations will be huge, right? It is not a guaranteed 10%, right? You never know if you, if you may be exposed to a situation where you are exposed to more of the downside volatilities, right? And that can disrupt your entire plan heavily. So never take all these averages, these numbers and, and see them as guaranteed returns, all right? Okay, moving on to the last myth. All ETFs are passively managed. Is this true or false? Nah, so definitely think? not. Definitely not. It's definitely not because... um. I think the recent news, um, S&P 500 made some changes to their holdings. Um, if I recall correctly, I think one of the investment, that, one of the stock that came in is called Strike. So I think, so So if you look at it, if the fund houses are so-called moving in and out of their funds, you know, definitely ETFs are not passively managed. Mm. What about which? So um, I would say today, if you're talking about passively, if you refer that to index tracking ETFs, Mm -hmm. Certainly, that still forms the bulk of the uh, AUM globally. Okay. Uh, more than 90% today are index tracking funds. Mm -hmm. A good example would be Straits Times Index ETFs. Yes. Uh, even S&P 500 ETFs, these are we call it the index trackers. Yes. And a lot of people call them uh, passive ETFs because the manager don't really add value in terms of additional research. Their role is to make sure that the fund tracks as closely as possible to the index. Of course, the index itself has screws that are set by uh, and managed by the index providers. But recent years, we do see there are growing number of uh, interest, or rather growing int investors' interest in the active ETF space. Uh, in January, we launched our first active ETF, uh, co-managed by two of the uh, uh, asset managers, Lang Global Investors and Nomura Asset Management. And that allows investors to have a, a first time in Singapore, have the ability to invest into an ETF that is actively managed. And there, so, so the main difference, of course, when you buy into an active ETF, you need to spend a bit more time to understand what's the strategy behind it, right? What are the managers doing to, make, to, to try and make alpha of the ETFs? Because end of the day, the only reason why, or rather the main reason why investors would buy into actively managed ETFs is because they believe that the manager or the strategy they employ is able to deliver a long-term returns that outperforms Let's say for Japan equities, it should outperform the topics on Nikkei 225. Uh, that should be the, the general expectations from investors. Mm, yeah, so actually actively managed ETFs, uh, it, they grew more popular, especially during the pandemic period, right? Yeah, but in fact, the first actively managed ETF that was launched in the United States was actually in the year 2008, right? And I also have some interesting statistics here. Uh, for the first 10 years that these actively managed ETFs were made available in the market, they never exceeded US $10 billion in net annual inflows, and the market share remained at just 1% of the overall ETF market. Right? But they really grew more and more popular in the last mm -hmm. couple of mm -hmm. years. So there are actually many different types of ETFs available out there in the markets for retail investors to pick from. And understandably, that can get quite confusing, right? So let's now zoom in at looking at the different types of ETFs that are available in the markets. So we have our sectoral ETFs, we have our thematic ETFs, as well as the more traditional broad-based market index ETFs. So Wei Chin, could you share with us you know, what are thematic ETFs, what are sectoral ETFs, and how are they different from the traditional broad-based market index ETF? Yeah, maybe you can start from the traditional broad-based, which indeed is still the core product that investors are buying to it. For example, S&P 500 ETF now is in between five to 600 billion in terms of its AUM. And that is huge, right? Given a single fund to have amassed such a kind of a, a, a AUM by a single ETF. Likewise in Singapore, the two STI ETF combined, they have more than 2 billion. Uh, then that is over like 20 over percent of uh, existing AUM that we have for Singapore ETFs. So most investors, I would say they would have started from a core uh, so that it is, it is exposed to the entire economy, all the sectors, be it financial sectors, real estate sectors, technology, consumer discretionary, non-discretionary. So they make sure they are being uh, well diversified across the country's uh, economy. 
But then again, depending on the market environment and depending on their um, projection of certain sectors, if they want to lean towards financial sectors, right, that's where sectoral ETF comes into place. Because then if you invest into a financial sector focused ETFs, you may be able to tweak your portfolio a little bit more towards the banks. And a lot of them are, might, might do so because of high interest rate environment. They do foresee uh, growth in the bank's profits in terms of the interest income. They want to increase the allocation and that's one way. And uh, there might be another group of investors who think that, for example, rates are going to be, be lower end of the year or cut further next year. They think that there may be a recovery for REITs uh, sector. I think that's a good time where they can add REIT ETS into their portfolio, use it to supplement the core they already have. So they allocate a little bit more in such sectors. And of course, for tech sector, I think that's something that investors has been uh, talking about in, in, in the market. And yes, if you think the long term, tech is still the sector that will grow the most. Um, there is always a venue for you to allocate more into a tech sector. Mm-hmm. Okay. What about Jeremy? Do they appeal to you as an investor? Unfortunately, no, because I felt that um, it's a little bit difficult for retail investors to predict the future. And in fact, if, if it's very difficult for any investors to, to predict the future and so on, we, can, we could probably at best um, guess certain trend. For example, mm. like the semiconductor where I guess nobody expects NVIDIA to, to skyrocket <laughs> this year. But, but these are areas that where I think it, it, it adds a lot of complexity to, to any investors for trying to predict the future. the future. So at least for my mm. case, I would think that it's better to just um, be safe in terms of investing with regards to ETF. So I thought that it's better to have a broad view, mm. have a broad approach, for example, the S&P 500, etc. Um, at least that be the baseline of any investments um, portfolio. And then if any investors, uh, after having sufficient knowledge on how do they how, how they pick stocks, etc., then if they want to move on further, then I thought that they could venture a little bit out, but with the fact that they have their base um, being right. secured. Mm. So that's where I'm looking at. Because if you ask me whether to go into thematic ETFs and stuff, um, sometimes you, you do make mistakes by choosing the wrong sector. Mm. And, 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 and all these mistakes, if I, look, if I take a bird's eye view of it, it's very similar to taking a gamble, taking a bet on, on, on that, that, that sector will do well, that sector will do well. For example, if everybody just beliefs in, 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 in ARK Invest and everybody has yes. dumped their money in and that's, that's, that's going to be very painful for them. And, and to me, it's very, very similar towards gambling. Okay. So I guess that all goes down to the, invest, the individual investor's um, mindset towards how he or she um, views investing and what, investing wants, uh, what, what he or she wants the investments to, to do for them. Mm-hmm. I believe that as with any investment instruments, there are definitely pros and cons. La. So on thematic ETFs, uh, they can be useful in a situation where let's say you want to gain exposure to a particular theme or a particular or very niche industry, uh, but in that industry, there's no clear leader yet. So in other words, the competition is very tough. Uh, if you look at the market share, right, no single business have been able to capture a significant market share. Uh, the companies, they do not have a clear white economic mode yet. Then rather than to speculate on which business would succeed right, and emerge as that eventual leader, uh, it would be more worthwhile to invest in a thematic ETF to capture the exposure in the entire theme itself. Uh, but having said that, you know, some of the themes, they may not play out. They may not succeed eventually. And oftentimes, you may only realize this five to 10 years down the road because you also got to give it some time, right, for these themes to play out, given that some of them are still work in progress. So that means to say you probably have lost money on your thematic ETFs investments. And uh, there's also this opportunity cost uh, where you could otherwise have put your money into some other investments that can give you a better yield. Yeah, so there are pros and cons. Uh, as for sectorial ETFs, um, right, like what you guys have mentioned, right? They are beneficial if you want to gain exposure to a particular sector, uh, especially more so because I believe in this concept called sector rotation, right? Where it talks about how different sectors they move at different pace. They don't all do well at the same time. They don't all do, do badly at the same time, unless it's an entire market crash, right? Uh, so if you want to write on this concept of sector rotation, then yes, sectoral ETFs would be uh, a good tool for you to gain exposure to capture on the opportunities in the various sectors at different point in time. All right. So looking back, could you guys still recall what led to the initial rise of thematic ETFs? What happened in the last couple of years? Well, I'm not exactly sure, but I guess uh. it's also because perhaps because of 
COVID and then uh. suddenly there's this huge spike in terms of the technological sector. Mm. And basically right on the point, I also we on, on the point of um sector rotation. I recall last year um the technological sector was one of the worst performing ones. Um but I think this year they were the one of the better ones performing. And I think healthcare is the one that takes yes. the opposite of it. Yeah, the opposite. <laughs> yeah, so don't know, maybe it could be social media is also trying to add mm. on a little bit of this kind of hype to it towards all these things. So I mean this is my best guess. Mm. What about Wei Chin? I would say it, it simply proved the fact that ETF is a efficient vehicle for investors to express their view because if you look at even in the past unit trust space, there is always a sectoral focus funds that focus on technology, maybe certain one for uh, focus on financial sectors. But of course, with the adoption of ETF rising, uh, you can see that investors, when they have their core covered uh, using a broad-based uh, ETFs, the next question they have in mind is that uh, what should I do if the market has you know the interest rate environment is changing um, there is a uh, growing use of 5G and uh, semiconductors uh, the, the news are coming out daily I think these capture the attentions of investors and they do want to participate in the growth of certain industries because things are changing faster I think these days and uh, ETFs allow them to be non more nimble in terms of capturing opportunities in the sectors and the dissemination of news, I think, plays a part as well. So these days, most people get their news sources online, digital. Yes. In, in the morning, in the first thing wake up, probably most people are looking right. at their iPhone. So convenient. Some of them for the news overnight in the US market. So I think this has created a lot of, uh, I would say, tendency and urge for investors to take action. And I think that is why we have seen a, a lot of investors are using thematic. Uh, really to capture opportunities uh, that a certain, uh, certain sector presents. Mm. Yeah. I think we could look back during the pandemic period right, where there was the historic low interest rate environment. Back then, if you take a look at the share price of many companies, right, whether it's a company that's making money or not making money, the share price shot up tremendously during that period, including the thematic ETFs as well. And I believe it works like a cycle. You see, when the share price goes up, people get excited. Now, when people get excited, more people will come in. Even those who previously had not invested, they will also start to come into the market. And that's where we will have a lot of inflow of funds and that can accelerate the rally of the thematic ETFs mm -hmm. back then. Right? If you look at the financial media in the last uh, during the COVID period, you know, every other day or every other week, you will be sure to see an article that was covering about thematic ETFs or ARK Invest, which you mentioned earlier yeah. on. Right? Or if you talk to your peers on the topic of investment, a lot of them are very keen about thematic ETS back then, right, a couple of years back, right. But right now, the situation seems to have taken some slight reversal, right. According to Bloomberg, in 2023, there was an outflow of $4.6 billion from funds that centered around clean energy and cloud computing. So currently, the underperformance of some of the thematic ETFs, uh, it has led to a loss of confidence among some investors. So why do you think investors are pulling money out of thematic ETFs now? Is this current decline, you know, just a temporary bleep? What are your views on this, Weichi? really depends on the market cycle. And I mm -hmm. think you rightly mentioned about sector rotations. Uh, and the higher interest rate environments that the mm. investors may have the expectations that uh, profit margin on certain companies will be affected in terms of the borrowing costs they are facing. Um, we do see globally uh, bond ETFs has seen more traction as well uh, because of its high yielding nature now. Uh, probably uh, sing, sing dollar bonds you get probably within 3 to 4% in terms of a bond ETFs. USD uh, investment grade probably will get about 4 to 5%. So that is indeed a lot more attractive than like during the pandemic cycle when uh, when interest rate close to zero. Mm -hmm. So investors are first might be switching over to other asset classes, and we probably will know that Singapore investors are allocating quite a bit into the money market funds and mm -hmm. also to the treasury bills, right? So these are right. alternative assets that they would be investing into as well. Mm -hmm. Sectoral wise, we do see a big interest in retail investors into REIT ETFs. Uh, in fact, okay. this year we have seen, uh, or rather, uh, for over the last 12 months, we have seen like 50% more uh, distinct uh, retail investors uh, using ETF in their portfolio constructions. And that is a big growth. And, and, and I would attribute it towards expectations. Probably REITs are now trading at uh, quite a low book PB ratio as well, price book ratios. And also, if you compare to the historical yield that these REIT ETFs offer, uh, probably now is, is much on the higher side compared to the last couple of years. 
Mm-hmm. What are some uh, investment strategies that uh, you think for investors who are looking to invest in thematic ETFs they can consider? I would say you should always start with proper asset allocation. Mm, right. I think right from the start we mentioned that sectoral base it will also be a high volatile, high volatility nature. So yeah. the question is to avoid the experience we mentioned. Um, many investors may have got in at the least part of market cycle for some thematics. And inevitably, when market corrects, they do see some portfolio losses. And, and I agree with, totally with Jeremy, right? You should not just sink into a certain sector because you read about news on it and you, you decide to get a maximum growth. Because the sector grew by 40% last year doesn't mean that it will grow on 40% year on year. So the question is, for such high volatility nature, very niche kind of a sector ETF, how much do you want to allocate, right? And and you should also know that at what kind of loss will make you you know, lose your sleep at night, right? Yes. You don't want that to happen. <laughs> if you want to be a passive investor, right, a passive enough not to actively uh, monitor position, you should always allocate certain uh, percentage mm. to each style ETFs. Even beyond that, beyond the markets, you should also look at asset classes. So you should also put some into bond ETFs or REIT or, or, or you know, precious metals mm. that would kind of diversify your portfolio and make you, you know, more comfortable in terms of your investing journey. Mm. What about Jeremy? So I think, for a start, for any investor, I think it's important to understand the rationale of why you want to go into investment and at the same time also make sure that you have enough capital that's being kept for rainy days. Um, because the rule of time is six months, but for me, you know, being a father, um, mm. you know, having my own responsibility at home and stuff, I feel that six months may not ex- exactly be enough. something, something yeah. enough. So I think it's something where you need to, you need to save up to the point where you feel that it's too much. Because I, I read a book by um, Morgan House, um, I think it's um, Same as Ever, the book. He says that, you know, you should save up um, to the point where you think it's a lot, you think it's mm-hmm. too much. So I think that's, that's a rule of time where any investor should have. So I think that sets the foundation for you being able to sleep at night. I think one key important invest- thing an investor needs to know is that um, whatever news that you are aware of, for example, if they say that semiconductors are going to do well, etc., uh, most probably everyone knows about it. Mm-hmm. So if this, if the stock has really went up 40-50% of it, doesn't mean that it can't go up even further. It can. It can still outperform. But you must understand that a lot of news, a lot of hype has already been baked inside. I thought that the safest way is just to buy the whole, like the S&P 500 or, or a whole basket of, 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 of ETFs. That would have been a better choice so that you get an experience on what this is about before you move into different sectoral invest, uh, ETFs or in fact individual stocks as well. Mm-hmm. So to add on to the point where we should talk about portfolio allocation, right? Yeah, that is really very important. Um, so because a lot of times people, they are just blinded by the short-term gains, right? But it's actually really important to consider the potential downside risk as well because you never know it, right? After you get invested into it, you may be exposed to that downside volatilities. So that's why a uh, portfolio allocation that aligns with your risk tolerance and such that you can sleep well at night is really important, right? So on top of that, um, I think it is also very important to focus on the fundamentals right uh, rather than what is trending right now or what's popular among the crowd because the impact of strong fundamentals or share price is much more lasting is much more enduring as compared to those short leaf fed right uh, although we are investing in ETFs but it is still very important to examine the underlying holdings of, of the ETF, what kind of assets are they investing in? Uh, for example, equity ETFs, what kind of businesses are they investing in, right? Are these businesses even doing well financially? Are they making money? For example, for me, myself, my personal investment preference is I don't like to invest in companies that are unprofitable, that are still burning cash at a fast pace, mm-hmm. even if they can grow their revenue at a fast pace. Because I don't have a clear evidence to tell me that they have the ability to generate earnings, to generate cash inflow organically through their operations. And at the end of the day, what drives value for us investors is really the either the uh, dividends that we receive or the capital appreciation. But what drives this, the ability to distribute dividends or for the share price increase, is the ability to generate earnings and uh, cash flows over time. That's why it's really important to still go back to the fundamentals, even though we are investing in ETF. But check out the underlying holdings. That's something that's important for investors to take note of. Okay, so uh, another question that many retail investors have is, how do I decide if thematic ETF investing is suitable for me? Is suitable for my investment goals or my risk tolerance? How can they go about looking at this? 
I would say it really depends on w- at what point of investment journey you are. Mm. So I think Jeremy brought a good point. A good starting point is always with a broad-based index mm. because that is almost like a uh, convention wisdom, right? Since the start of ETS, if, uh, if you want to diversify your risk, buy the whole basket, right? Why, uh, if you are not an expert in stock picking, mm. buy the whole basket. So whether or not sectoral, I mean, you can go into a bit more detailed analysis and certainly would advise that you, uh, any new investors consult financial advisors before they take any investment decisions. Um, you should really look at the amount of risk volatility that you could tolerate. Probably for myself, right? You should not uh, invest because somebody said that you should invest <laughs> or because yes. everyone is investing. You should invest right. because it's an instrument for you. Do your homework. Uh, are, are these companies don't really mention, right? Although it might be difficult if it's an index of 500 or 2,000 companies. Mm. But at least do your homework to understand broadly what are the companies in the basket. Mm. Are you going to buy into a very small cap or very narrowly focused ETFs? Um, why are you buying into it? So ask yourself the question, right? Are you buying because it has gone up 40% last year? That, that's not a very good answer because you have seen that what goes up may come down. So, so you need to ask yourself some questions, right? Do you know what are the companies in the, in the basket? Do you know why are you buying into it? What kind of expected growth they, they are going to exhibit in the future? I think if you could answer this by yourself, uh, with the help of a financial advisor, ideally, maybe you could start. If not, then uh, I think the safer approach, of course, is to start slowly, uh, form your core building blocks, uh, make sure that you're diversified, mm. and then one point at a time, right? You you may at some stage uh, uh, be be financially uh, or rather s- sophisticated enough to go into certain sectors. Mm. What about Jeremy? I think the reason for you to choose a particular sector is must be something where you are either you are either involved in it or you have very much knowledge in, in this area so that at least you are able to understand the future, the potential of, of this sector per se. Now, the second thing I think every investor needs to do is that at least go and look at the top 10 holdings of yes. the, in, the ETF that you're buying. Um, of course, it's impossible to look at every one of it, yeah, but at least understand right. the top 10 of them. The you know, what are they doing, their figures, what's their potential. And if they can, at least go and read their earning calls and, and, and not, not just the latest one, but read a, a series of earning calls to understand whether if the managements are carrying out what they have been saying over the past few years and not is not just uh, uh, um, doing for show per se. Mm. So there are a lot of homeworks that needs to be done when when they choose any sector sector in uh, ETFs because... Mm. I think that at the end of the day, it's important to look at what are your investment goals at this point in time, right? So predominantly, are you looking at capital preservation or capital growth, right? If let's say you are someone who is nearing retirement or you're already in the retirement phase, then yes, capital preservation will likely be your main priority. Then in such a case, perhaps thematic EDS may not be as suitable for you given the higher volatilities, right? For you, maybe then income investing will be something that you want to consider because you want to make sure that money is put into the stock markets and then they distribute dividends which can cover my living expenses. So take a look at what are your investment goals right now. And another thing is in terms of your investment time horizon, how, how long do you have, right? Uh, given that some of the themes could still be worked in progress, so maybe you will need more time, a longer investment time horizon. So do you actually have that? So these are some of the areas to consider, right? Um, and based on both of your experience, what are some of the common mistakes that you see investors make when it comes to ETF investments in general? So I think you've mentioned it a few times, right? You are chasing after returns. Mm. So some ETF that have been uh, heavily marketed could be due to the performance you have achieved in the last probably three months, six months, a year. Yes. So you should not be, as an investor, probably if you are doing it for your investment planning, be a bit more cautious when you are looking into ETF, when you're selecting, you're shortlisting the ETF you want to invest. Returns, and again, we mentioned that past historical returns should be used as a guidance, but it don't reflect future performance. So don't place too much emphasis on that. It should be a, it should be a you know, parameter they're looking at, but don't overly, uh, don't depend that on that mm. as a sole criteria. And, and, and I think that's the, that's the, that's going to be the key one that, uh, I would say. And beyond that, do your homework, right? You need to make sure that uh, um, you understand fully. I, I, just to echo back what Jeremy mentioned, right? He mentioned a good point on understanding the top 10 companies. 
And if you look at all the fun fact sheets, they do put up the top 10 names, the yeah, top 10 names of the, uh, of the fund. And that is really to encourage investors to do their own duty, mm. all right, to understand what are the top 10 companies they are buying into uh, before they do their investments. Mm -hmm. What about Jeremy? So I think the most basic, obvious mistake that any investor should not do when it comes to ETF investing is to invest in hype. Uh, yes. Um, I think that's that's the key key message that I wanted to drive to everyone because we all, for all of us who chased hype in our investing journey, we paid a price and it's hurtful. So just don't invest in hype. It's very hard to curb um, greed. It's very hard to curb FOMO because we are right. all human and we have all emotions, emotions and, and <laughs> greed is always part of part of it. But just know that the losses is very painful and it hurts even many years after that. So just never invest in hype. Mm -hmm. Another common mistake uh, when it comes to ETF investments is the tendency to invest in multiple ETFs without really understanding what you are investing in. What's the underlying holdings? So previously, I have uh, heard from one of my students who shared that last time before acquiring more knowledge, right? What he would do, what he would do is he will invest in multiple ETFs because you see, uh, we all know that ETFs are diversified, right? So many investors have that. Uh, notion, they have that idea that, okay, then since then, ETF is diversified. So if I invest in multiple ETFs, I must be very, very diversified, right? So therefore, he started off with investing in multiple ETFs. Then after some time, he started to look at what he had been investing in. Then he realized that there have been many significant overlaps, right, in the underlying holdings, the companies that the ETFs he invested in tracks. So therefore, his portfolio lacked true diversification. So at the end of the day, diversification only works when you invest in investments that have low correlation with one another. Then they can help to even out the impact, yep. right? But if you invest in investments that are tracking the same company or maybe different company, but all in the same sector, then your portfolio will still lack true diversification. So that will be one thing that uh, investors should take note of, right? So moving forward, Wei Jin, what do you think are some of the emerging trends for the ETF space, including thematic ETFs uh, that you think will be relevant and they have a place in today's world? Themes evolve over time. Mm. And today, probably some of the most commonly heard of theme is artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's certainly driven the stock rally of certain uh, companies. Um, in terms of internet, 5G communications, mm. I think these are still going to drive the key theme in the markets. Um, we do also see a lot of investor interest into sectors like EVs. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, certainly, uh, it hasn't performed well lately, uh, especially for the Chinese companies because of some yes. uh, potential risk in tariffs. Uh, but these are still trends that we see uh, country and risk policies are being uh, put, uh, focused on. Um, so, uh, so I think these are some key trends. But, but that being said, uh, in Singapore, I think we are seeing investors also focusing on traditional sectors, mm. right? Uh, like financial sectors, REIT sectors. Uh, these are sort of, I would say, uh, in, to some extent, evergreen. Uh, in a way, depending on the... And, and you brought up a very good point on in ability to generate uh, cash flows. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, not only on these thematic, like future technologies, uh, but also on the traditional uh, sectors, these are probably, given the high interest rate environment and investors being uh, seeking for yield, I think these are going to be some of the key sectors that will remain in focus, mm -hmm. in, uh, at least in the coming years. Mm -hmm. yeah. So with uh, Singapore's green push, as well as many other countries, do you think uh, clean energy would be an area that would be relevant for investors to look at in the upcoming years? We, we do see a big growth, uh, not only for retail, but also from institutional investors. So mm -hmm. for example, today we have about six uh, sustainability-linked ETFs. Uh, it, ra it ranges from green REITs, meaning that uh, buildings with uh, good energy consumption, uh, water usage, or waste management uh, criteria. We do have uh, com ETFs that are based on the uh, carbon emission profile of, of the uh, companies. So it rates, it grades the company based on the carbon, carbon emission. We do have ETF that tracks the climate actions, mm. right? So what, are they, what proactive steps are they taking? to reduce their current and future carbon emission footprint, right? So these are some of the ETFs that we have launched, I would say since 2021. And now we are seeing uh, probably close to a billion in terms of total AUM. Mm. So institution and retail are, are do, I think they do see that this is taking shape in future and interests are probably building up along the way. 
Okay, so let's have a quick Q&A segment as well. Um, so Jeremy, do you have any questions to check in with Weixin on the topic of ETFs? Yeah, so I do have one. So basically, um, if you look at the S&P 500, it's actually being so-called led by a few individual stocks um, that are driving the, the share prices. And then the, the behind few are actually lagging per se, um, if you look at the performance of the individual company. So the question is that, you know, should investors be investing in the ETF or should they just buy the top 10 companies instead? Yeah, and that's a very good question. And I think a lot of people have heard about the Manificent 7, yeah. mm. which has probably uh, done way better than the S&P 500 as a mm. basket. But the question is, of, of course, then for how long can they maintain that growth in share price? If they have done like collectively, assuming they have done 90% last year, um, can they do another 90% year on year? Mm -hmm. And would there be a correction upcoming? Okay. Because the correction for such a high growth stocks could be pretty high. You are talking about maybe over a week or a month, you could see 10-20% correction to the single stocks, but not to the S&P 500. So again, it depends on your, your, your investment nature, right? Again, nothing wrong for investors to want to hold only a few stocks, but then you must be able to stomach the risk. Um, that over the next few years, it may underperform S&P, it may outperform. Um, so really what you're looking for, are you looking for a decent enough return with a lower volatility or you want to get over a short term high returns? Uh, it's possible with a few stocks because then they may be, be move in the right direction given that many of them are tech focused, but you got to bear with the pain if a correction comes from the tech sector. Right. So what are the top five traded EDS in terms of volume uh, right now, currently? I think if you're talking about retail investors, uh, SEI ETF is still at Evergreen. And mm -hmm. very good reasons for it because in today's, uh, I would say, interest rate environment, a lot of them are looking for cash flows. Mm. And STI for now is giving probably close to 5% in dividend yield. And that has given comfort to many investors. And, mm. and again, the, the index components, the top three are the bank's stocks which again tend to uh, do, and it has done generally well last year in terms of the dividend it paid out, uh, in terms of the share price that he has uh, uh, performed. The other ones would be on the REIT ETFs. Uh, again, I think a lot of them are going for the yield. Uh, that being said, although there's been a drawdown uh, over the last one year plus, um, I think investors are positioning their portfolio to capture the eventual uh, recovery of the sector. Uh, two more asset class, I would say one of them is gold ETFs. So in Singapore, we do have a, a gold ETF that is tradable in SING dollars and USD. Mm. A lot of talks are going about de-dollarization, about the you know inflation being sticky. And I think traditional wisdom from finance textbook is that gold is a good hedge against inflation. And traditionally, it has proven to be so. Um, so that is another asset class that I would say retail investors has been trying to use you know, and it's tradable using cash, CPF, um, IA, I, CPF, OAIS, or SRS. So that is a very, uh, you know, efficient tool for deployment. And last but not least, uh, we do have uh, Hang Seng Tech ETF uh, that is uh, heavily traded. Uh, part of the reason, obviously, is also because of the time zone, right? Although it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's Chinese companies, but it's easily accessible through SGX on, uh, through the ETF structure. Maybe can I just add on one question um, because we are in Singapore. So the closest we have is STI. So maybe what are the considerations an investor needs to have um, when you compare STI versus um, the S&P 500? Just to make the point clear as well, we do have S&P 500 ETF. Uh, mm. US S&P 500 is also among the top 10 traded stocks. Uh, and I think under SRS schemes, uh, because SRS only allows Singapore listed ETFs, it's also among the top five traded ETFs for retail investors. So that should certainly proven that S&P 500 is also popular among the Singapore investors. So consideration, of course, come a few points. Depends on the, if you look deeper into the index itself, what are the sectors that it focuses on? Singapore one, it gives you a lot more exposure to the financial and REIT sectors. Mm. Collectively, they make up probably close to two-thirds of the index. And that certainly, I think I mentioned different stage of life. Some investors uh, may prefer higher income yielding product. I right. think SDI has proven that point. Consistently has deli delivered a, a dividend yield uh, that is higher than typical nominal interest rates you can get in the market. And S&P, 
And though with a much lower dividend yield, I think we're talking about below 2%, one-ish, one, one -ish, mm. uh, it does give you the exposure beyond Singapore companies. Mm. And there are some names that uh, I think is common names that you hear uh, in the market. So it, it's a good complement, and which is why we believe that ETF is the way for investors through a few instruments. Like what I mentioned, your friend has bought many of them. Probably you don't need many of them. But with the right ones, you could use them to, you know, really expose yourself to quality companies in Singapore that you know them well. And I think that goes back to Germany's point, right? The three banks, the couple of REITs that we have in the, we have about 40 REITs, right? Most of them are common names, which explains the reason why we do invest the same into it. But beyond it, you have other instruments like S&P 500, ETFs, or, uh, you know, other gold ETF to build your complete portfolio. All right, so as we draw this podcast to a close, uh, what final advice would you like to share with young investors who are considering ETFs in general? So if you are very new to it, start with something small, something you could afford to, as I mentioned, sleep soundly at night, right? Mm. You, you don't want something that scares you the next morning you wake up and you're scratching your head, why have I lost money? So you should always be prepared to take risks if you are going to, you know, investing into non-capital guaranteed instruments. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, and so start small, start with something you're familiar with, right? Uh, typically a broad-based index, ETFs. Uh, add on some of the more safer products, like bond products, like bond ETFs. Make it multi-asset, make it uh, reduce the overall vol. So start, start with small amount, make it diversified. I think that's uh, probably a good way to start, right? Before you are thinking of aggressively uh, you know, putting all your portfolio into a uh, into the ETF. Mm -hmm. Right, so I believe that definitely ETFs have a place in this investing journey for retail investors, right? And they can be really useful and beneficial, right? Um, the broader message I hope to bring across is that ETFs, similar to any other investment instruments, they are simply just tools that can help us create wealth. So the manner in which we utilize and operate the tool is what will ultimately determine our eventual success in the financial markets. So having said that, how can we actually utilize these tools appropriately? So firstly, which we have talked about a lot of times, take a look at the underlying holdings of the uh, the companies, the assets that the ETF invests in. Um, are they doing well financially? Uh, if you're investing in multiple ETFs, are there significant overlaps right, between the di different ETFs? And secondly, I would also like to take a look at the past performance, which we talk about. Right, While past performance is not indicative of its future performance, but at least it can allow us to gain some insights on how this ETF has been performing, its past track record, and so on. And finally, um, given that there are many different types of ETFs available, right, which you guys have actually mentioned that it would be good if let's say you are new to investing, you want to start off with a broad market index ETF first, right? As you gain more exposure, as you gain more experience along the way, then perhaps you want to ask yourself whether you want to then start to venture out into other types of ETFs like sectoral ETFs, thematic ETFs, or even into individual stocks and so on. Right. So those are some food for thoughts uh, for young investors who are looking to invest in ETFs. And it has been a really insightful discussion that I have with both of you, Wei Xin and Jeremy. And I hope that our viewers and listeners also had a great time tuning in to this episode on Exchange Traded Funds ETFs. Until next time, keep your FOMO in check, stay informed and happy investing. If you're feeling fired up and ready to dive deeper, feel free to hit us up. Leave your comments below. We would love to hear your questions and topics that you would like us to cover in future episodes.